Hi, everyone. I'm Jennifer Hoppe. I'm the executive director of the Fort Tryon Park Trust. And uh, I want to thank you all for coming to our workshop today. Um, we're the organization that um, partners with the Parks Department in caring for Fort Tryon Park and all of its plants, trees, and shrubs. We probably have over 700 different varieties. That's a lot. Um, and the, our park plays a, uh, an important role in the larger environment of New York City and then in all of our lives. So today we're excited um, to bring something to the community and to bring two incredibly gifted people from the community, author Leslie Jay, who wrote The Honeybee Hotel, and uh, as well as among several other books, along with um, A Field Guide to the Natural World of New York City. Is that the right title? Yes. And artist Jessica Mafia, um, visual artist who was born and raised here in New York City. And her work has been exhibited throughout the US and is currently in the flat files of the Pierogi Gallery in Manhattan. Um, she, for, for some of the parents listening, she created the artwork for musician Childish Gambino's two singles, Summertime Magic and Feels Like Summer. And uh, she has a solo exhibition, the Denise Bibro Fine Art Gallery in, in Chelsea. And it, it, it featured her large photo, photorealistic pencil drawings of urban cracks and residue. But if you go on her website, jessicamafia.com, you'll see, they're beautiful. But Fort Tryon Park has a wonderful community and these are some great people from it. And um, we're excited to um, create with and inform and educate all of you. And uh, you can make your wonderful rock creature to bring on your next walk through the park. Um, so I'm gonna mute you everyone. And you can raise your hand since we're a small group. And if you wanna talk, raise your hand or if you have a question and don't be, uh, don't be shy. This is for you and uh, for our park community. So enjoy. So I'm gonna turn it over to Leslie and um, uh, everybody has their rocks. Yes, can you say yes? And maybe at the end, we'll have a chance to display some of the artwork that we make, okay? Sound good? I think we might've lost, is it Arden? <laughs> take it away, Leslie. Okay, thank you, Jennifer. I'm so happy to be here with all of you. I'm gonna share my screen now. Oh, where is it, where is it, here it is. Share that and move you over here and play from start. Okay, get this out of the way. Um, so I'm going to be talking about several important insects in the park and what they do for the park and its plants and how they do it. Um, and of course, the first animal I'm going to talk about is the monarch butterfly. But really, if you have any questions, there are just a few of us, um, just raise your hand. I'm happy to have you answer your questions at any point in my talk. So the monarch. Um, the monarch has a very long straw-like mouth called a proboscis. But when she first approaches a flower, her proboscis is curled up because when she lands on the flower, and this is a milkweed flower, very important in, in the life of the monarch butterfly, and I'll tell you why in a minute. When she lands on any flower, she tastes it first with her feet. So she has sensory organs in her feet that allow her to taste. If it tastes good to her, she unfurls her long proboscis and inserts it into the flower and drinks up the nectar. Now, she will drink from any kind of flower, like this beautiful goldenrod that's blooming all over the park right now. Um, and not only does she drink from the flower, but she carries pollen that covers her body. And she takes it to the next goldenrod flower and pollinates it, which makes the flower able to produce seeds. So the plants themselves 
can have babies thanks to the monarch and other insect pollinators. But even though she can drink from any flower, she will only lay her eggs on the monarch leaf, on the milkweed leaf. So this is a kind of milkweed that's growing in the Heather Garden, um, one of my favorite places in Fort Tryon Park. Now in late August, the mother monarch lays her egg underneath a milkweed leaf. And in three or four days, the baby caterpillar emerges and her first meal is to take a few bites out of her egg. She's tiny, she's white. Um, she has little black hairs coming out of her body. Uh, she has a black head and she's, the, her egg is so small as maybe the size of this period at the end of the sentence. Wow. Uh, but her body is so small that it's hard to see at first. But she eats and eats and eats milkweed leaf after milkweed leaf and after a couple of weeks becomes huge. Now she's ready to go through her next stage of life in metamorphosis. And that is, she becomes a pupa or a chrysalis. She sheds her skin, her caterpillar skin, and underneath she's mostly green. So when you see, whoop, I don't know, I don't know if you can see this, gotta move it there. When you see the chrysalis of a monarch, it looks like this, it's emerald green with beautiful golden dots. And after a little more than a week, um, you can start to see her change into a butterfly. Now, the covering is clear. So when you're looking through, you see the green body of the pupa that eventually becomes the butterfly. And then she's able to break out. You can still see the golden spots and the black spots, and you can see that it's clear. And she hangs from her chrysalis, so those little hooks on her legs, and her body pumps fluid into the veins. These black stripes are the veins of her wings. So this is her lower wing, this is her upper wing. And soon she's able to leave her chrysalis entirely and fly off to a flower to feed. Now, at this time of year, she will join thousands of other monarchs who are on their way to Mexico, where they will spend the winter. It's too cold up here for them. So they fly, 3,000 miles from New York City to Mexico to spend the winter there. And I'll show you a map. Move this over. Um, and so here's our little butterfly. Here's New York, right about here. There's Long Island. Here's New York. And the butterfly is, the butter monarchs are leaving now. Um, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of them, making their way south across Florida, across the Gulf of Mexico to this area in Southern Mexico. And millions, millions of butterflies from all over the United States uh, and Mexico join them. And they congregate together on these huge trees. And then at the end of the winter, so in late February, early March, they start to leave Mexico and they start to return to where they came from. So they head north. So if this is our little butterfly and it takes her about two months to get here and then she spends another three or four months in Mexico. Our little butterfly leaves. She makes it to Texas where the milkweed is blooming and she mates and lays her eggs on the milkweed and she dies. And then her babies go through the caterpillar stage, through the pupa stage, through the adult stage, and take off continuously heading north, where she ends up in the southern states, mates and lays her eggs and dies. Her babies make it back up to New York City, where they spend the summer feeding and mating and laying their eggs. And then that next generation, the fourth generation, again goes to Mexico and starts that cycle all over again. So this summer, when you're in the Heather Garden and you're looking at a milkweed plant and you see a butterfly, 
you will have to know it's the great granddaughter of the butterfly that left a year ago now to go to, to winter in Mexico. Mm -hmm. Now, when you're looking at monarchs, there's a way to tell the difference between a male and a female. In every respect, they look alike, except right here. The males have these two little black dots. The females don't. But the females have much wider veins than the males. The males' veins are thin. And of course, the whole purpose of a vein is to carry nutrients around the body. We have veins in our body, too, that carries our blood and oxygen. The same for butterflies and the same for all animals. Any questions on monarchs before I move on? Sam, are you stretching or do you have your hand up? Stretching. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Our next insect is the ladybug, a great friend to the plants of Fort Tryon Park. So here's her life cycle. In the spring, she lays these beautiful little yellow eggs under a leaf, like this. She lays them under a leaf so that they won't get rained on or blown away by the wind or eaten by other animals. After a few days, they hatch out. And this is their larval stage. They don't look like a caterpillar because they're not a caterpillar. They're a beetle larva. And they look like little alligators. And they, from the moment they hatch, they start to feed on these tiny insects called aphids. Now, the larva is very small because the aphids are really small. The aphids do a lot of damage to plants. They feed on the sap inside of plants. And the sap is what carries the food that the plant makes all around the plant. And so it's very damaging to plants when the aphids start to drink up all the sap. And so the ladybug larva is a great friend because she eats all these little aphids. And then after a week or so, the ladybug larva forms a pupa. The resting stage kind of glues itself to the leaf and emerges as a, an adult ladybug beetle. So here's the head, here's the thorax, here's the abdomen. All of the legs and the wings are attached to the thorax. These are the wing casings. She lives a year, which is a really long time for an insect. And the reason ladybugs can live a whole year is because they overwinter here. And they like to huddle together in this curled up leaf throughout the winter. They might also come into your apartment or your home um, and congregate on your windowsill. And you know, if you do see that, it, it's a good idea to spray a little water near them leave a, a few drops of water because they get very thirsty and they'll dry out and die. So you wanna make sure that they're well hydrated. And then in the spring, they'll go back out to the park. Um, at first they might hide out inside of a blossom like this peach flower and oops. And then they'll go and do their job and land on leaves and start eating aphids again. And then when it really warms up, the ladybug will lay her eggs and she will die and the next generation of ladybugs will hatch. Now she'll always try to lay her eggs where there are aphids. You see the little aphids? The aphids can be yellow, they can be green, they can be black, um, but they all look like this and the ladybugs will feast on them. Any question about the ladybugs? Okay. The wonderful honeybee. Um, so I took this picture in the Heather Garden of a honeybee feeding on the nectar of a scotch broom flower. And you can see this pollen ball on her back leg. And um, I'm going to talk a lot about that in a minute. So the honeybee is still collecting pollen and nectar, even at this late time of the year as long as it's warm out, as long as the sun is shining and it's in the 50s or, or low 60s, which it is today. Yesterday, where it was pouring rain and cold and raw, 
you wouldn't be able to find any insects out yesterday because they, they would die. They need to be warm enough to fly and to drink and digest their food. But right now, the honeybees are still collecting, as long as they can, they'll be out there collecting honey and pollen, which is their food. Honeybees are pollen magnets. So you know when you rub a balloon on your hair and you get that static electricity in your hair goes flying out? Well, that's what it's like with honeybees. They're covered with hair. And when they approach a flower, sometimes the pollen just flies all over their bodies. They even have hair between the thousands of lenses in their huge compound eyes. And the pollen sticks to that too. Once they're covered in pollen, they have combs on the edges of their legs and they comb their bodies and they comb all of the pollen off and they moisten it with the sticky nectar that's in their mouth and they form a pollen ball, which they stick onto their hind legs on a part called the pollen basket. And the pollen basket is a is a depressed concave area on their back leg. They also have to clean off their antenna. So one antenna is called an antenna, two are called antennae. But once they go into the dark of the hive, they can no longer use their eyes to see. They rely on their antennae, which are covered in thousands of sensory organs. They can hear with their antenna, they can smell with their antenna, they can touch with their antenna um, and they have to keep them clean. So when, sometimes when you see a honeybee leave a flower, you'll see it clean off their antenna too. Now, they take in through their proboscis, they drink up nectar and they carry it in a honey crop and they carry the pollen in that pollen basket. And they go back to the hive, this is inside the hive, and they regurgitate the nectar into these cells. Now, nectar is mostly water. It's sugar water, but it's mostly water. And so to create honey from that, the honeybees fan their wings over the nectar and they evaporate out the water until it's mostly just sugar. And so it goes from maybe 90% water to maybe 18% water. Mm -hmm. And that way the honey will last throughout the winter because it's their food. They also bring back the pollen and, and they kick off the pollen that's on their pollen basket into these waiting cells. Now you'll notice there are lots of different colors of the pollen and that's because every plant has its own colored pollen. And so for a beekeeper to look into his or her hive, and if they know their plants, they'll know what flowers their honeybees have been to. There is even blue pollen. Isn't that so beautiful? So we have a plant growing in the park called Scylla or Siberian squill. Look at this pollen in the pollen basket. Every part of this flower is blue. The flower stem, the petals, and the pollen. And our friend Ken Shia took this picture, probably of a honeybee in the Heather Garden. Well, soon it'll be winter. And although we didn't get any snow last year, which was so sad, right? Hopefully this year we will get snow and the Heather Garden will be a winter wonderland again. But, well, we know the monarchs have gone to Mexico. We know the ladybugs are hiding somewhere protected. But what about our bees, our honeybees? Well, they spend, let me move this. They spend the winter in their hive. They shore, uh, they they seal up all the openings in their hive and they surround their queen. So here's the queen. She's the biggest bee in the hive. She has a long golden body. She lays all the eggs. She's a mo the mother of all of these bees. And all of these bees are females. They are the workers. They surround their mother and they shake their muscles and they shake their wings and they create heat. 
And even though it may be zero degrees outside, inside the hive, it's 92 degrees. It's like being in Florida inside the hive. And so they are able to survive. And they have all that honey that they stored and all the pollen they stored. So they have lots of food to eat throughout the winter. Once it warms up, the bees come out again. Now these are crocuses and sometimes they bloom as early as February. Um, and so on a warm day where the sun is strong, the bees will come out again and get more honey and more pollen and come back to the hive and the queen will start laying eggs again and the life of the hive will go on. The queen lives about four years. Um, the, the workers, it depends. The ones that live through winter maybe will live eight or nine months. The other ones live about three or four weeks. So an insect's life is short. There's just a couple of others I wanted to show you. I'm not gonna talk about them, but if you're interested, um, we have lots of these beautiful little flower flies that help pollinate. And you see, they look like a bee. And that's just an adaptation to protect them because when other animals see them, they think, oh, that's a bee. I'm not going near that animal. It might sting me, but it's not, it's a fly and it's called a flower fly or a hover fly. So you might see them hovering near the flower. And another beautiful pollinator is the Ailanthus webworm moth. It looks like a beetle when it's on the flowers, but when it's in flight, it looks like this. So that's my part of the presentation. Before we move on to the art, do you have any questions about these animals? No? Nope. I have a question. What? Um, nice. Ladybugs, do ladybugs fly? Yes, ladybugs fly. So that orange part you see, that's called the elytra, and it's the wing coverings, and that comes out, and there are wings underneath. So the wings emerge underneath that orange part. Cool. They do that. Yeah, very cool. They're very good flyers. I have a question. Yeah. Has anybody on the call been on the the um, carousel at uh, the NYBG that has a lot of these creatures? No, it, it, at the Bronx Zoo. The Bronx Zoo, that's right. Yeah, the bug carousel. Bug carousel. Sam, you've been on it, right? Yes. Ah, yeah, and Hannah, I know you've been on it, right? <laughs> yeah. And there's even a dung beetle on it. It's my favorite place at the zoo. It's so wonderful. <laughs> and it shows all those stages of metamorphosis that I just talked about. Right, right. So now we're gonna hear from Jessica. Now I'd like to introduce my, my dear friend, Jessica Mafia, a wonderful artist and art teacher. Hi everybody. Leslie, that was so wonderful. Thank, Thank you. you, so inspiring. So are you guys ready to paint some pollinators on your stones? Let's start off, let's make sure everybody has their rocks. I already saw um, everyone's rock. And let's Did I make stop sure. my share? Wait, should I, oh, I yeah. stop okay. my share? Okay, go ahead, okay. now we're good. And let's make sure everyone has their paint ready and their paint brushes. Hopefully you were able to find some that are kind of skinny, um, but if not, you could use a Q-tip if you want. And it would be good to have some paper towel to clean off your brush and something to squeeze your paint on, maybe a plate or a piece of cardboard. So does everybody have all their materials? Thumbs up? Okay, awesome. Let's start with our friend, the ladybug. I am going to just, let's take a moment and take a look at this beautiful ladybug. Um, can, so we've got three colors here, right? We've got a black head with some white spots on it, and we've got the red wing cases. So, we're gonna start by painting our ladybug's head. Now, if you guys, for some reason, don't have those colors, red, black, and white, that's okay, because we're artists and we can use our imaginations and get creative with it. You can make a blue ladybug, you can make a purple ladybug, whatever you'd like. So let's grab a black if you have it, or any color you have if you don't. Let's find our roundest stone, because ladybugs are kind of roundish, and of course, they don't have to be perfect. Some of my stones are rough, some of them are smooth. The one that looks most like a ladybug to you. And I'm gonna squeeze out a little bit of black for the head. 
and I'm gonna grab my nice skinny brush and I am just going to, now we're gonna paint the top of the stone and the sides and then let that dry. And after class, if you wanna paint the bottom of your stone, you can go ahead and do that, but it'll be easier to rest it if we don't paint the, the bottom now. So we'll grab our black and we'll just paint the top, a little bit of the top for that little ladybug head, just about up to there. So I'll paint it on the sides and I'll get it. There we go. And you have your little ladybug head. And then, um, you guys probably know this, but we always wanna clean our brushes for the next color, clean them nice and good in our water, and then dry them off in our paper towel. And the next color we're gonna do is the red for the wing case. So I'm gonna go ahead and grab some red. Let's see, I've got a nice dark red here. Squeeze a little onto my palette, which happens to be a pizza box. Palettes can come in any form. Oh, and by the way, we're probably going to get a little messy today, a little paint on our fingers, because then that's totally okay, because artists like to get messy. So we'll grab some red, and we'll go ahead and paint the whole body red. Fill the whole thing on the top, on the sides, all the way up to that head. And you know, sometimes you may find um, this happens to you. I know it happens to me. My colors might mix a little bit on the on the ladybug and that is totally okay. In art, we like to say that there's no mistakes. There's just happy accidents. So if you do something that you don't like, you can just wait for it to dry and paint over it. No problem. So I'll paint my wing case all the way up to the top. Getting my fingers in there a little bit red. And my rock is, has a little bit of crevices in it, so I'll try to stick my paintbrush in some of the holes, make sure I fill it all up. So there we go. And now I'm going to blow on it a little bit, just to make it dry a little faster. And I'm gonna pull up a picture of the ladybug again, see what else. So we've got, we've got our head, we've got our wing cases. Now we need to paint our black spots. So I'm noticing there's a spot up here near the head, and I'm also noticing that these, these spots are kind of symmetrical. They're the same on each side. So let's go ahead and paint our symmetrical spots. So I'll wash off my brush, clean it on the paper towel, and grab some more black. Now for the spots, they're gonna be kind of tiny, right? So I'm just gonna stick my brush in a little bit of black and put it right just on the tip of the brush. And when I make a spot, I'll do just a, a nice tiny little dot. And then I'll do another dot on one side and a dot on the other. And let's see, I'm gonna throw in a couple more dots wherever my heart sees fit. So mine's gonna look just like that. And then I also noticed that the ladybug has two wings. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna draw a little line down, right down the middle, a nice skinny line to show the two different wings. Just like that. Now there's one more thing I think our ladybug needs. Let's look at it again. I noticed that there, was the, there were these two little white spots on the top of the head. And apparently they're not eyes, but they're part of the ladybug. So let's add them in. So let's clean our brush. Wipe it on the paper towel and let's grab a little bit of white. And we'll do these two little white spots right on the top of the head. And I'll, I'll blow it one more time, just to dry it off. And I'll add a little white spot on the top, and there we go. We've got our little ladybug. Now, I'm gonna put mine to the side and let it dry, and then I'll probably paint the bottom red later, like I did with my guy from before. He's all covered. I would love to see your guys' ladybugs. I, I can see yours, it looks amazing. Um, Sam, if you're able to hold yours up, I would love to see it. Oh, and that looks great, Arden, oh my goodness, I love it. That's, that's beautiful. And Hannah, can I see yours? Oh, fantastic, you guys did such a great job. Okay, let's stick our little ladybugs to the side and let's try the honeybee next. So, I'm um, gonna share my screen. Let's 
do a little bit of observation. You know, artists and scientists have a lot in common. We both like to observe very carefully. So I notice here that this honeybee is, is kind of a warm yellow and that it's got these black and yellow stripes. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take my yellow paint and I'm gonna mix it with a little dab of orange, just a tiny little dab, because orange can be a very strong color so that I can make a nice warm amber honeybee color. So take your yellow, take a tiny, tiny little dab of orange and grab a, whichever paintbrush you wanna use and we'll mix, mix, mix them together and try to get a nice warm ambery color. I'll show you what mine looks like when I mix it. And if it needs to get a little darker, I'll just add a little bit more orange. My amber color is gonna look something like this, more or less. Not, I, um, Leslie taught me that the honeybee is not quite as bright yellow as say the bumblebee like this. So we'll make ours a little warmer. Okay, is everybody ready to grab their honeybee stone? I think I'm gonna choose this one. And if you guys have mixed together a nice warm um, yellow, will you hold up your paintbrush so I know you're ready? Okay, I notice Aya's ready. I think Sam, you're ready, right? And Arden, you too. And what about Hannah? Ready to go, excellent. So let's start by making our yellow stripes. So I'm just gonna take my skinniest brush I have and put some paint right on the tip. And I'm gonna paint a stripe right across the bottom. And then another stripe right in the middle. And I think I'll squeeze another stripe right on top. You guys can put as many stripes in as you can. I was only able to put three. I've got a, a tiny little stone. And once you've done your yellow stripes, you know, I'm noticing that mine's a little bit light. I think I'm gonna do a second coat. I'm gonna paint my stripes one more time, make them a little brighter. And I can add to the sides, and there we go. So we've got the yellow stripes. And when you're all done with your yellow stripes, clean off your brush, and we can go ahead and add our black stripes. Right in between those yellow ones. And you know, I think I'm gonna do my special blowing trick too to help it dry a little faster. Okay. So now let's get those black stripes in. So I'll, again, I'll take the black just on the very tip of the paintbrush so I can make nice, nice and thin lines and I'll add a black stripe. And a lot of times with stripes, I notice when I'm painting it on paint that's already wet, they might, the colors might start mixing together and that's totally okay. You could always paint right on top of it or wait till it dries and paint over it. So I got one black stripe and two black stripes. And I'm filling all the spots and there we go. Now there's one thing our honeybee needs that's really important. Well, you know what? Let's add our eyes first while we've got our black. So I noticed that the honeybee's eyes are pretty big, right? Two big eyes in the front. So while we have our black, we can go ahead and add some two big eyes right in the front. One and two. Now, the other piece we're missing are the wings. And these wings are transparent, which means we can see through them. So the way we're gonna do it is we're gonna paint them in white, and then we're gonna paint little white stripes across. Not fully paint, not fully colored in white, but just little stripes to show that it's transparent. So we'll clean our brushes really well. Make sure they're nice and clean for our white. And wipe them off on our paper towel. And I'm gonna paint my wings. Let's see. Well, the shape of the wings, they're kind of like, sort of like long skinny ovals more or less. So I'm gonna paint mine right from that black stripe one oval, like that. And get a little more paint on there. And 
second oval, like that. There we go, we've got two wings. And then to add those little lines, I'll get a little bit more white paint just on the tip of my brush and I'll draw one, maybe two diagonal lines just to give an indication. I may have painted a little bit too much there. I can always clean off a little bit, but that's okay. How are your honeybees coming up, coming out? Do you guys want to hold them up so I could see? Or it looks like we're still working on them. That's looking good, Aya. And let's see. Hannah, looks like you're still working too. Is yours done, Sam? Oh my God, that's awesome. I love your honey pee. That's <laughs> so cool. Let's see, Anna. Oh, that's fantastic. Beautiful, and I love those eyes. How's yours coming along, Arden? Beautiful, I love it. And Aya, how's, how about you? That's so cool. What a creative honeybee. I love it. Okay, so I'm gonna stick my honeybee on the side to dry, and again, I'll paint the bottom later. And last but not least, we are gonna paint our monarchs. So I'm just gonna hold this up for you. I have decided to paint my monarch on the biggest rock that I could find, which wasn't very big, but here's mine. That's a good sized one. Nice, excellent. So for the monarchs, let's take a look at what they look like. So these beautiful monarchs, they are orange and black and white. So the first thing we're gonna do is, you know what, let's just check in for a second. Is everybody ready? If you're ready to paint your monarch, give me a thumbs up. Awesome. And Hannah, I didn't see you, thumbs up? You ready? Okay, fantastic. So let's begin our monarch with the black body. So get your black paint ready. And I noticed that the monarch's body is kind of oval shaped. So you'll see mine is, it's like a, an oval down on the bottom. So we're gonna grab our black and let's do a nice black oval right on the bottom. Just like that. And then let's, let's throw in our monarch's antenna and I notice if you can squeeze it in, it's a little bit hard for me. I put two antenna and the end of the, of the monarch's antenna is a little bit wider. So if you wanna add a little bit of like a fatter top to the antenna, you can do that. And then let's take a look at the shape of the amazing monarch wings. I noticed that they're sort of made up of like two triangles one triangle on the top that's sort of longer and taller and another little skinnier triangle that's sort of rounded at the top. So let's grab our blacks again to do the outline and I'm gonna to need to squeeze a little bit more black here. So oops, and I'm gonna get my skinniest brush I have, even better. Okay, so we'll, get, we'll do the outline of the top wing which is like this big, long, tall triangle with a rounded shape. And then we'll add the bottom part of the wing, another sort of little bit shorter and fatter, second part of the wing. I'm drawing a sideways version of a monarch, like one that's landed on a flower. Okay, so we've got our outline and we've got the body and the antenna. Now it's time to clean our brushes and grab some orange to paint the wings. So squeeze yourself a little bit of orange and let's blow on our monarchs, let them dry a little faster. And we'll grab some orange and we're gonna try to just fill in the wing shapes, all orange. Nice and orange. And since your black is still a little bit wet, we'll just try our best to just stay in the middle of the wing instead of painting the outline. But if it gets a little black, that's okay too. You could always paint over it with orange after. 
go, a little bit of orange inside that wing. You'll notice one of mine came out great and the other got all, all mixed up with black. So I'm just gonna let that dry, wipe it off a little and just put orange right on top. No problem. I'm getting there. I'll add a little bit more orange to brighten it up. There we go. Now it's turning orange. Now, I have a question for you guys. What else do you notice about this butterfly? What are we missing? We have the orange wings. We have the black outline. We have the antenna. What, what don't we have? Uh, the dots. Good. So we need some white. Now, wait, let's look one more time. The dots, I notice, are all along the outline of the butterfly's wings, right, on the black outline, and they're also on the body. So let's get our brushes nice and clean, and let's add some white dots. Now the dots are tiny, right? So again, we're just gonna stick the very tip of our brush in and try to do really tiny little dots. And every once in a while, you paint some dots and then you could wipe, wipe your brush clean, get some more fresh paint, and add some tiny little dots all the way around the perimeter of the wings, a little bit on the body, There we go. Oh, we're missing something else. Let's see if we can, if you guys can help me figure it out. I see these bright orange wings. What else does the wing need that we haven't painted yet? I remember Leslie mentioned it's the thing that helps the nutrients travel throughout the insect. Any guesses? Is that a hand, Hannah? Let's see can we, if I can unmute you, or can you unmute yourself, sweetie? Yes. I think you're still muted, love. I'm not sure, Jennifer, can you, oh, there you go. Yeah, what else are we missing? Um, do we miss the tongue? Oh, the proboscis, you're absolutely right. Yes, we can add that in. I don't know if I have room on mine, but I can try to squeeze it in. The beautiful rolled up tongue that unfurls when it lands. Let's do it. What else? Is there anything else that we're missing, guys? The lines of the black. The black lines, the veins. Excellent. So let's go ahead and go back to our black paint. And we can add a proboscis if you have room. And I'll Stop the share. You could draw a little black rolled up proboscis. Mine's hard to see. And then you can draw some veins in there. I'll keep the picture up so that we could draw from what we see. I noticed that the lines go up about halfway and then they and then there's some shorter ones connected to that. So draw my little veins. And of course this requires a nice skinny brush, nice skinny lines. So you could squeeze a couple of veins in there. And there you have it. When you guys are finished with your monarchs, I would love to see them. Mm -hmm. I see all these little artists busy at work. Oh, that's beautiful, Arden and Arden's mom. <laughs> nice work. And let's see Hannah. Wow, that's gorgeous. I love it. A beautiful little butterfly on a big stone. And Sam, it seems that you have disappeared, but I would love to see your butterfly if you if you finished. And Aya too. I did really bad. Really bad? I think that's awesome. The, the monarch was kind of a harder one, right? Because we have all these tiny little details in, on, a, on a tiny little rock. 
And no, I, um, I have really rough rocks, so it's hard. Yeah, my, my last one was rough too. That's why mine didn't come out quite, <laughs> quite as smooth as the other. Um, but I think yours is great. And Aya, can I see yours again? Let's see, will you hold it up a little closer, sweetie, so we could see? Awesome, looking good. Well, I think we've just about come to the end of our workshop. Do you guys have any questions for me? Or for Leslie or for Jennifer? I would just like to say seeing all these children painting is so wonderful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it just warmed my heart. <laughs> <laughs> I hope everyone has a, a, a whole array of uh, ideas now of what, uh, what you can do painting wise in the winter. Exactly. So maybe, maybe start collecting rocks on all of your walks and we'll put this video up on the Fort Tryon Park Trust website. So if you need some inspiration uh, in the cold months where we're having to stay inside more, yeah. this will be.